The San Jose International Short Film Festival is excited to be able to have a conversation with Marshall Curry, one of the filmmakers uh, from one of the films that you just saw. Pleasure to meet you, Marshall. Great to, great to meet you, too. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Thank you so much for being here. So um, let's talk a little bit about the beginning, um, when you first started, because I, I see a lot of documentary work that you've done, and I see a lot of the things. Um, one in particular um, really stood out for me, the, the piece that you edited together. Uh, was it Night of the Garden? Was that? Right. Yeah, that's right. That is, for those of you that don't have an opportunity to see it right now, uh, you need to go to marshallcurry.com. Uh, is that correct? That's right. And um, and check it out. But can you just briefly explain what that project was about? Sure. Um, so uh, I have a friend who's a screenwriter who um, was writing a screenplay that takes place in New York in 1939. And we were out for dinner one night and he told me, did you know that there was a Nazi rally? that filled Madison Square Garden in 1939 on George Washington's birthday. And that there was a 30 foot portrait of George Washington with swastikas on either side of him. And that the whole arena was filled with Americans cheering for, uh, for Nazism. And I was sure that he was wrong, that if this were true, it was something that everybody would have learned about when they were growing up. And uh, I went home and looked it up and sure enough, he was right. And it was this part of America's history that um, that we, you know, are have not faced. Uh, and so I started um, looking around, got an archival researcher, and it turned out there was footage of the rally that night. So uh, so I made a, a seven minute film, um, the shortest film nominated for an Oscar in 50 years or something like that, and um, and it is entirely made of footage from that night. Um, so it just sort of drops the audience uh, into this arena in 1939, and it is a frightening, uh, a frightening night, and it is a film that unfortunately I think has a lot of resonance today. Tremendously frightening, but the footage is actually pretty spectacular. Had that ever been composed before in any kind of way? Because I, I, I think I've heard of clips before, but not the whole thing. That's exactly right. Uh, there, there was footage of it, but, but nobody had ever really pulled it all together. There were pieces that had been used in newsreels back in the 40s. But, um, uh, and then, of course, some historical documentaries had had little clips. But I think we were the first time to, to kind of gather it. And there were pieces in the National Archive and pieces in UCLA's archive and Greenberg archive. And we were able to find audio clips that didn't have footage. And we had found footage that didn't have audio. And, so it took a little work to, to, to piece it together. Some of the footage, the film at the National Archive had never even been scanned high definition before. So wow. we paid for the lab fees to get that done. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, you, you have a leader that comes out on stage and, and he attacks the press and he tells the audience that we need to take America back from the minority groups that are destroying it. And, um, and to be able to wrap that kind of hateful ideology in the icons of, of America, the flag and the national anthem and the pictures of George Washington, it was, um, it was really pretty repulsive and yet very familiar. You know, reading about it and finding out that they actually, you know, co-opted a, a, an orchestra from one of the uh, Broadway shows to come in and do backup for God Bless America. Um, and the fact they even they even did the pledge of allegiance there. Um, it was. Uh, I mean, it was, it was billed a, as a pro-America rally, and there's sure. you know there's a famous a famous saying that when when you know fascism comes to America, it's not going to come with a German accent and swastikas and looking like German fascism. It's going to sneak in and it's going to call itself you know Americanism. And every country does this. You know, every country sure. has demagogues who 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 try to use the symbols of patriotism to sell uh, hateful ideologies against, against other people. Now, as a storyteller, you're drawn to these very interesting stories, 
But in a lot of ways, for that particular thing and for some of the other projects you worked on, you become quite the historian. You're literally chronicling people's lives. Is that Was that something that you expected to be able to do or something that you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I'm curious about people. And so, you know, what dragged me into making documentaries was just a curiosity to see how people live and how different people think. And my films range from so many different topics. You know, my first one was about urban politics. It was called Street Fight, uh, followed Cory Booker's first run for mayor. Then I made one called Racing Dreams that's about two boys and a girl who live in, in the South and Midwest and they want to become NASCAR drivers when they grow up. And, um, and then I made one called If a Tree Falls that's about radical environmentalists in Oregon who would burn timber companies. And, um, and uh, Point and Shoot is about a guy from Baltimore who goes and joins the Libyan uh, revolution against Gaddafi. Um, so, uh, at, you know, then A Night at the Garden and then, uh, and then I've started making fiction films. Um, so I've, I, I, I'm always interested in understanding the complexities of different people and, sure. and, and understanding, you know, their cultures and their stories that make them see the world the way they do. Gotcha. So when you actually started uh, moving into the fiction realm, well, was there a it was there a specific driver or was there a certain type of story that that said, you know, this is something, this is your next stage? I think I just got an itch. You know, it was really just a creative itch. I, I before making documentaries, I, I'd done uh, worked at an internet design company, and um, before doing that, I'd worked at a public radio station, taught high school students. So I've I've, I've always had a little wanderlust, creative wanderlust, and um, and I think after you know having made a number of documentaries, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to try making a movie where you get to tell people what to say and where to stand and all those things where when you're making a documentary, you just have to, you know, hope things are interesting. But uh, with, with fiction, you got a, another level of control. Were you either scanning for that piece that you need or else you're just standing there holding the camera waiting? I think one of my favorite shots, I think it was on Street Fight, uh, one of the earlier ones, uh, there's a the photo of you. I think you're holding an HVX 200 right. and, and I'm going... Man, the days. I remember the days, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, the, for Street Fighter, it was actually a PD-150. So it was, oh, uh, there you, go. you know, it's a tiny, tiny little camera. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the, the film that played within the festival. The Neighbor's Window is such an amazing piece. And I can tell you that it was one of the films where I'm watching it and I am taken by not just the subtleties of the performances and the story and the way that it's all put together. But for me, it was really about how 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 invested I got and how deep I went down the rabbit hole. Because mm. you start to feel like you're part it's of it. nice to hear. You know? Yeah, that's great to hear. So what was, what, where did the script come from? How did this come together? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I, uh, like I said, you know, made documentaries for years, decided I wanted to make a fil fiction film and thought a short film might be the best way to get my feet wet. And, um, I've got a number of friends who've crossed over from docs to fiction and, and that's, you know, they can spend years working on scripts and trying to raise the money and all this. And I just thought, you know what, why don't I just make something? I just want to try making something. So I, um, I had an idea for that movie. I, years before I'd heard this terrific podcast um, called Love and Radio where, um, where a woman tells a story um, about a neighbor the neighbors moving in across the street and she develops this sort of rear window obsession with watching them. And, um, and the story is beautiful. It's called um, the living room. So people can Google it and listen to the original, um, the original story on the podcast. Um, and it just stayed with me. And, and I had a couple of ideas for ways to, to, you know, additions and subtractions and ways to change the story. And so, um, so I emailed the woman who told, who had told the story and said, how would you be okay with me? Um, making a, you know, making a short film that's inspired by your, by your true story. And she said it was okay. And so I wrote the script and recruited a, a crew and got some terrific actors and, um, and we shot it in four days. Well, you being the master of Segway, let's talk about those terrific actors because that it's a remarkable cast. So how did that come about? Um, so the, the lead of the, of the film is Maria Dizia, and she um, is just an incredibly talented actor. Um, 
And it's interesting because she often plays somebody's friend. You know, she plays a lot of, of uh, supporting roles, but the way that she uh, performed in this film, it shows that, I mean, uh, it's just a matter of time before she uh, is, the, is the lead in a big Hollywood movie, I think. Absolutely. So, um, she's got such subtlety and, and real, just a beautiful, subtle uh, way of expressing herself. She is a, a, a theater actor, so she um, is Tony nominated. Um, and I got to know her, it was funny, when I was growing up, I, uh, I went to public school, but there was a private girls' school in the same town in New Jersey where I lived. And um, I was a little bit of a hippie in high school and my mother really wanted to, to uh, um, channel that into something productive. And so when she found out that this girl's school was gonna do hair and was recruiting guys to be in the play, she said, oh, you should go try out for hair. And so as a 10th grader, I went over to that school and, and tried out for this play and got in and ended up loving the, the director of the, of the drama program, was this amazing mentor um, who uh, I ended up doing Romeo and Juliet and uh, Equus. And I was in an experimental um, play with, uh, with Peter Dinklage, actually, um, who you know is from uh, Game of Thrones. And sure. um, he went to a private boys' school in the same town. So we did that play together. And um, anyway, I stayed friends with this, uh, with this um, the, the director of those plays, and we became adults. And um, a few years ago, he got married, and I went to the wedding and sat next to Maria Dizia at the <laughs> reception, who, it turns out, had also been a student um, of this teacher. She's about four or five, about five years younger than I am. So we didn't really know each other, but um, we struck up a conversation and I told her that um, I was thinking of making this movie and, um, and she read the script and, and very graciously agreed to, to, to be in it. Wow. That is, that's that the serendipity of how that works out is always the, the best part of it. It's, it's hard, hard to explain. We of course dedicate the, the, the movie is dedicated to my mother, but also to this, um, to this uh, drama teacher who brought us together. That's incredible. I know that uh, it's hard because I think a lot of people that from an audience perspective, they see a film and they think about that final piece and how important that is for them. But for a filmmaker, um, they tend to, filmmakers tend to remember those days when, you know, it was hot or we didn't have the right gear or, you know, all the things that happened. So can you give me a little insight as to the kind of production shoot it was and a little bit behind the scenes? Sure. Um, it was tough. So we shot it in actually my apartment building. So it's not in my apartment itself. I need, I live on the first floor, but I spent months and months trying to find two apartments that looked into each other's windows. Um, and because I needed access to both of them, I didn't want to fake it with digital effects or anything. And sure, I sure. knew that, um, that, that to make it feel real, if, if you could find really the apartments and you could shoot those long shots where you have a character and a window and then you can see the other window with characters in it, that it would, there would be a, a level of, uh, of you know, realism, emotional realism that would come from that. So I looked around and looked around and finally somebody, one of my neighbors said, you know, we can see into our neighbor's apartment. Um, and uh, so they very generously let us film in their apartment. And I went and knocked on the door of the people across the street and said, hey, we're gonna shoot a movie. I wondered if you'd be willing to let us just have access to your apartment for one day so that we can stage some of these scenes in your apartment. And they also very generously allowed us to do it. So, um, so we, we, we shot for four days uh, on the, the night of the, after the first day of shooting, um, there was a blizzard, a freak blizzard that hit New York <laughs> City. And it was a disaster because we realized that we were supposed to shoot um, the second scene of the movie where they kind of have the argument. Um, we were gonna shoot half of that scene one day and the other half we were gonna shoot the next day. And there were just some logistical reasons why we were breaking it up that way. Um, but we realized that if we did that, um, half of the shots were gonna have a blizzard of snow coming down in the window and then you'd cut to the reverse angle and there would be no snow. So we ended up, um, scrambling we did a quick little tweak to some of the lines in the script and we just decided we're going to embrace the snow and so we shot some scenes of the snow from the windows we tweaked a line so that 
Maria complains about having been out in the snow all day. She was, it was supposed to just be a rainy day. And she says, I, I was out in the snow all day. And then we shot, we reorganized the shoot so that we would shoot every shot with a window in it on the day that the snow was falling. And then all the reverse angles we were gonna shoot the next day when, when, when this, we knew the snow wouldn't be there. Anymore. So, um, so that was, that was one of the challenges, one of the many. Yeah, I, I think there's something remarkable. Can, can you, from a technical point of view, because we do have a lot of filmmakers that uh, will watch this and and we'll see this. Tell us about a little bit about the, like the size of the crew, and also uh, if you can give me any, like what kind of camera or anything else about that. Yeah, so we um, we used two cameras. One was uh, an Amira, Ari Amira, and the other one was an Alexa Mini uh, that was sort of mounted in a in a um, a um, sort of like a. a um, a steady cam for all of the moving shots we, we use that and then um the crew was uh maybe 30 people something like that so big for a you know for a documentary what for what i'm used to working with but but pretty quite small for uh for for a you know fiction production usually um and everybody was sort of jammed into a couple of apartments some friends let us use their apartment for uh uh for the the wardrobe and makeup and another one was the was the lounge for for everybody for and, crafty. yeah exactly exactly so um it sounds like a, a, just a remarkable experience i is, so when you get into the filming and you're doing this like for me there are moments in the film that that really get into like um well, i forget the line exactly i think he says something about like you know she's athletic or she's very flexible. Very, Very flexible. flexible. Yeah. And then, and then she, she says, says <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's hot, hot too. too. Right? right? Something, Something along, along those lines. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I was just like, like that, that, that felt, felt so much like, like a married couple. couple. Did they have any time to work together? Was there any time to rehearse? Or was this some, one of those magic things that happens on set? Uh, a little bit of both. So um, it was magic. Uh, so I found him. Um, I had been... I had a casting director who was sending over people. I had other folks who were sending me people and I just could not find somebody who felt like the character I was imagining. And I was even starting to think like, okay, maybe I just need to change my notion of who this guy is. And, and, and then one of my friends sent me this guy's reel. And as soon as I watched it, Greg Keller, as soon as I watched it, I was like, that's exactly who I had in mind. And so I called him, I asked him if he would do it. He said he would, I was so thrilled. It turned out, he and Maria had played husband and wife in a play. <laughs> and so they walked into the set and it was like, just they snapped right into their husband and wife uh, routine. So they're both terrific actors and I'm sure they could have done it anyway, but, but they could just walk right in. And it was like, uh, it was like a 30 year old, you know, a 30 year married couple sitting down together. There's also something amazing about working with theater people that they tend to, uh, they're, they're prepared for the long takes. They, they also memorize every line for the entire thing <laughs> before it starts. Yeah, they were versus, both versus the runaway, let me go learn this line kind of thing. Um, well, somebody told me that 90% that of, uh, of, of directing is casting. And, uh, and I think there's something to it because I just remember that feeling when they first, when I, you know, they sat down to do the first scene and I heard the words that I had written you know, and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and had a very particular way I was imagining them to be said. Um, and suddenly the words came out of their mouths and they didn't sound like my writing at all. They sounded like thoughts that these few people were having, you know, sure. feelings that these people were expressing. And it was just magical to see something transformed that way by, by, by such great actors. When you start hearing the lines coming out of the actors and they're delivering something, and there's a, that moment of magic where you start to see something. You kind of go, this is as good as I thought it could be. It's at a different level. Well, what, when did you notice that? How, how early did you notice in the process of filming? I mean, literally, it was very funny because when we were setting up the lights, we shot the first, the first scene in the movie is actually the first scene we shot. So they're at night and they're sitting down at the table and they see the neighbors for the first time. Um, and so we had set up the lights and we had two PAs that were sitting in their seats um, while we got everything set up. And then we said, okay, and we cleared them out and Greg and Maria came and they sat down in the seat and I looked at the monitor and I was like, it's a movie. 
like it changed from being um, from being a set to being a movie as soon as they sat down and they just have that presence. And then when I heard them start to speak and and they're so terrific at just being able to do variation, you know, variations on line readings. And we said, you know, let's do one where you're a little madder. Let's do one where you're teasing more. Let's do one where you're it's funny. Let's do one. And, and they could just do it again and again in these variations that are that were really you know fun to fun to work with i i was really impressed with the not just the the way that the characters were, were working but the way that you use the physical space um because i thought that was really I, I was just really impressed by the use of that and also like you said by shooting and actually having the physical i can see that other apartment across the way um now you 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 said you didn't want to do something in CG or do a creative fake thing. Um, from a logistic point of view, what did that work out the way you expected it to? Uh, was it everything you wanted it to be or was it much harder? I mean, it was very hard. Uh, fortunately, I had a terrific DP, um, Wolfgang Held, who is a guy who shoots documentaries and I'd worked with him on documentaries and he also shoots fiction. So that was a great partner for me. It was somebody who knew the things that I knew and knew the things that I didn't know and was very, uh, you know, was, was a great, great partner on, on all of it. So we had spent weeks before anybody came to set mapping out all of the blocking and where all the camera setups were gonna be. And um, so on the first day when we got there, we had very meticulous plans for exactly where people were gonna walk and what they were gonna do. And of course we ended up bending some of that plan once we got there and realized this or that, but um, but uh, um, having planned that really made a big difference to be able to to get to the performance and not have to um, not have to be you know figuring those kinds of things out right on the set. Scrambling on the day of exactly. I mean, there's always tons of scrambling. So <laughs> anything that you can take off the off the to do list before that first day. Is, um, is is really time well spent. Now, having gone through the process of getting nominated for an Academy Award before, uh, now this time has to be completely different, right? It was different. Um, well, for one, you know, I don't know anybody that 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 in the in the short branch. So the way that the Oscars work is each branch picks their nominee. So I'm a member of the documentary branch of the Academy. All of the members of our branch are the ones who pick the nominees and the actors branch picks their actors and the directors branch picks the directors. And there's a, sh a branch that is short films and animations and that's who picks the, the, the nominees for the short fiction film. So, you know, I didn't know any of anybody that was in that branch or, or uh, so I had no idea whether people liked the film or how much they liked it. I mean, I knew it was winning awards at festivals, but, um, but it was hard to, um, it was very hard to gauge and hard to sort of pitch people, you know, in, in these categories, there's not a significant amount of money that gets spent on campaigning. It's not like, no. like what you hear and, uh, you know, if you read the Hollywood Reporter, but, um, but, uh, but, you know, ultimately the process is make a movie, work as hard as you can, hope it turns out well and people like it. So you get nominated, that's a surprise. And um, you were on short list. People were looking at the film. People, you knew people were in, interested. Um, what's that moment of actually winning feel, feel like for you? It was great. It was really fun and surprising and stressful. And um, uh, but you know, you work so hard on these things. You don't you don't expect to make money. You don't expect anybody to you know. You don't know if anybody will see them. So to 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 have people say, hey, we liked that. That was that moved just. Um, that's kind of all you can all you can hope for. Terrific. Well, it's a perfect perfect place to to, to end the conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time, and thank you for um, being here as part of the uh, San Jose International Short Film Festival. Well, thank you for in including the film and, and and sharing this with everybody. We all the all the filmmakers really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Thank you.